Welcome to the Make Your Mark podcast. Hey everyone, I'm Mark Moyer, author of Win Again, speaker, career coach, and business advisor. And I help athletes, executives, and entrepreneurs reach their fullest potential. What you're going to be hearing in every single episode are conversations with athletes and other sports-related influencers. And we'll be offering you the insight that you need to succeed in life, including advice that will let you jump past your competition, whether it be for a great new job or taking your business to a much, much higher level. Make sure to connect with me on social media at Mark Moyer Coach and go to my website, markmoyer.com, to get access to the tips and strategies that my coaching clients get directly. If you're looking for ways to make your mark, send me an email to mark at markmoyer.com and I'll get you going right away. Thanks for joining me today. It's going to be an awesome episode. Now, are you ready to make your mark? Let's do this. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Make Your Mark podcast. I'm broadcasting live from podcast headquarters here in the Big Apple, New York City. And I hope all is great wherever you're listening, whether it's in the United States, Canada, Mexico or somewhere else on the planet and I'm thrilled to have you here. And I'm also thrilled because I just had a great conversation with Cody Royal. And Cody is a, he's an Aussie, he's based in Toronto. He does all kinds of things, man. This guy is currently the national a Canadian national coach of Aussie rules football. He is uh, he wrote an amazing book where others won't and honestly one of the best books I've read in quite a while and you'll hear you'll hear everything about it in a few minutes. And uh, he's also a partner in a company called NTSQ, Extreme Sports Experiences. It's really crazy what they do. It's amazing. Uh, you're going to love this guy. You're going to love the episode. Uh, it, it really, uh, it flies by and you're going to learn so much. He also throws in some bonus little exercise tips for people like me that sit on their butts behind a computer screen all day. Stuff that you can do to lose the gut. And I can use a, lose a little bit of that gut. Anyway, you're going to love this episode. But before we get started, if you haven't done so already, check out this podcast on iTunes. Leave a review. Subscribe. Get involved. Send me an email to mark at markmoyer.com. Go on to my website, which is markmoyer.com, and check out all the other podcast episodes. They are great. And let's get things rolling now with Cody Royal. Happy listening. I'm thrilled today to have Cody Royal as my guest on the Make Your Mark podcast. Uh, Cody has a very impressive background, aside from being an author and a current Canadian national coach of Aussie Rules football team, but um, he's involved with a variety of different endeavors. And I'm going to jump right in by saying first, hello, Cody. Welcome to the podcast. G'day, Mark. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's absolutely my pleasure. And, you know, you've had a bit of a whirlwind last few weeks, and uh, I'm sure that you're just starting now to get back to normal. But um, we won't guess necessarily get into what's been transpiring if you don't want to. But uh, what I will say is uh, that I had the opportunity to read your book uh, uh, recently, and and it's something that we've discussed before, but most people tend to write books uh, where they it's it's sort of just a – uh, you know, sort of an upsell to bigger programs that they have. It's not necessarily a business book meant to give advice. And most people just motivate and they kind of go get them. You'll be great. Here's my story. Now you can do it too. But what you've done is you've really, I mean, this is a, a book that's jam packed and it's right here, by the way, listen, that's the book right there. <laughs> in case you're wondering. That sounds um, like it. Cause yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty funny. Yeah, sounds like, let's see, that was about a 164-page smack right there. <laughs> anyway, um, but, but what I loved about it was that you pull in advice from a variety of different people, but you tie it all together, and you've really written a, a fabulous book. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. We're also going to discuss Aussie Rules Football and how it's uh, a game that should be played much more globally, wouldn't you say? I would agree 100%. I thought you might. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about coaching, about recruiting, and we're going to cover a lot of ground. So ju just to jump right in, Cody, tell me a little bit more right now uh, of what you're doing sort of these days, what's keeping you busy, and what's going to keep you busy going forward. Yeah, certainly. Well, I'm a, a small business owner as well, so um, I – part on a company called NTSQ Sports. So we're a, a marketing and event company specialized in endurance sports. So me and my business partner, Travis McKenzie, uh, he's based out in Vancouver. 
so we operate uh, kind of at the brand level and the event level and the athlete level within endurance sports, so cycling and triathlon and marathon running. Um, so that's our, our day-to-day business. And then, yeah, obviously I, I've written the book, which was released in December. So I've started getting on the, the speaking circuit. That's a, a sports business crossover and kind of looks inside pro sports teams. Um, and then also, like you mentioned, I, I coach Aussie Rules Football in Canada, which is a, a native game to Australia. Um, so all in all, I, I'm very, very fortunate. I get to spend all day, every day around high-performing athletes and the sports world, both on the individual side and the, the team side as well. So I know a lot of people want to break into that market. And I'm very, very fortunate to be able to spend my days doing that. Uh, you absolutely are. And, you know, what's interesting is that – People say, well, gee, Cody, it sounds like you've been an athlete your entire life and that's all you've done. But no, that's not the case. I mean, you actually have been a corporate guy for a while. Yeah, a decade. I, uh, my background, I, I was a high-level Aussie Rules player when I was in Australia. Uh, I'm from Melbourne uh, and uh, didn't get drafted into the, the professional ranks. And so I went into the corporate world and have kind of worked up through – HR and then to sales and in recruitment and then also spent some time here in Canada for one of the big banks here. So yeah, I've, that was kind of the notion behind the book is that I have seen inside, you know, the boardroom, uh, you know, in big companies in, in major markets around the world. And I've also seen inside the locker room with some of the highest performing sports teams. And so it was an interesting parallel because you, you tend to see, you tend to get, pro coaches that have never been in the business world write business books, but they don't really necessarily understand it. So I thought that was an interesting spin there. Oh, absolutely. Well, and, and what's interesting is that, uh, I mean, we have a similar background to an extent. I spent some, uh, a fair amount of time in the recruiting space and also doing some coaching. And it's, uh, it's interesting because when you see things from a recruiting perspective, you really fully understand what you should be assessing as a recruiter and or, you know, trying to figure out what is the best type of person to bring into a company or a position. And, you know, there, there are a few different elements I want to bring up in the book because I, I, I thought it was fabulous. And uh, so I'm going to jump right into one segment where, you know, one, one of the things you talk about is, is uh, how to really find good people. And, you know, one of the people you, you call out or you mention uh, is Ray Dalio of Bridgewater. And, you know, I have a quick, uh, I'll let you talk about Ray in a minute, but, but I have a quick, interesting story about Ray Dalio and Bridgewater. Uh, several years ago, I was considering making a transition from being an, uh, an agency recruiter uh, and, and head owner and considering going in-house. And one of the companies I was considering working for was Bridgewater. And they have a very, very unique, uh, we'll say corporate culture. And, and one of the things that they really wanted to make sure I was comfortable doing as a recruiter was making sure that I made it clear to every single applicant that this was not like any place else on the planet. And, and I, I thought that was really interesting. I wasn't quite sure I wanted to make the commute up to Connecticut and so forth where they're based, but it was really an interesting place. I mean, people, yes, they scream at each other and they're very upfront with each other and they, they, they sort of, uh, uh, kind of getting each other's faces about things and they call each other, they're accountable to everybody, but it can be fairly effective, but I'd love to hear your take on, on the Bridgewater approach. Yeah. So the, the specifically with the recruiting side of things, what I really honed in on, and this was kind of the, the name of the sub chapter that I write about in my section about recruiting is show your warts. And that was one of the things that I had been writing about in the sports world for quite some time. And it was the first time that I'd heard something similar in the business world was um, when Ray came out with his book. Um, And, you know, he's got a whole chapter called Hire Right because the penalties for hiring wrong are huge, Yeah, Um, which couldn't be more true. But in the corporate world, we spend so little time uh, thinking about our recruiting process and really kind of adapting to what we need right now. Generally, what will happen is everyone, the hiring manager sees it as a monotonous process. And so they just, they grab the last job description. They don't change anything. They just try and replace the person that's just left. And it's just very, very cookie cutter. 
and so it was really refreshing to see Ray write about Bridgewater and, and say that, you know, it's got to be a um, an equal process. We're going to show them our warts and tell them what we're not good at, and we expect the candidates to do the same thing. Oh yeah, uh, you know when you you often hear about how in an interview people say, "Well, tell me about your strengths and weaknesses," right? But these guys really do want to know what your weaknesses are. They want, you know, right off the bat. And uh, it's uh, it's a uh, I think it rattles some people, but it kind of, uh, as you said, uh, it in their mind anyway, it really takes away uh, potentially wrong hires. And you know the. The funny thing about that whole approach, and, and when you mentioned that whole concept of hi- having the critical element of hiring right, is that, and this was a message I tried to get across to a lot of the hiring managers out there that tried to find and use low budget solutions to recruiting and finding people on the cheap and only, you know, sort of posting ads in newspapers or online and hoping that some people find them. And I say, look, you can save a lot of money now and, and hire someone on the cheap. Or you can, and then basically lose a tremendous amount of money when you need to either rehire a few months down the road, or the person that you hired does a, a subpar performance and messes things up, which takes months and months of fi- fixing, right? Or you can really invest the, the time and the effort and the money in, in hiring the right person. And I think that's a lot of what it, Ray talks about. It's what you talk about, and uh, you know, we're we're all on the same page with that. We've seen to convince the rest of uh, corporate uh, America, Canada, et cetera, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, people are smart. And so, you know, there's so much bravado that goes into the hiring process, which just leads to disappointment. You make all these grand promises to all these people. You know, this is a great environment. We're going to set you up to succeed. Within a month, that person has realized that that's not the case and you're not going to set them up for success. And you've literally just given them a computer and said, here you go. Um, start to do your job and so I think there's a lot more care that needs to go into that process and and hence why I think the sports world um, has thought about these processes because they're spending so many millions of dollars to bring these people in and so they don't want to mess that process up and really what I'm saying is you don't need to copy what pro sports franchises do because um, they are very different but at least look at the frameworks that they use and adapt them to your unique circumstances. Well, absolutely. I mean, you're 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 so correct when a when a professional team or even the co- uh, collegiate teams now are they're bringing in and paying millions and millions of dollars to these coaches to come in, and you know, part of it is because the coach has a tremendous track record of not just coaching a, a team to success in the sport, but also what they do with the with the with the teammates, with the with the team itself, and how they can uh, sort of grow and. Uh, lift up those people to continue on in life. So it's, uh, but it's an interesting, it's the same, it's the same thing goes with management in, in a corporation. It's, it's gotta be a situation where a manager is leading by example. A manager is also leading by, um, you know, certain, certain elements that really, I mean, leadership is so essential and a manager has to be a tremendous leader. Uh, and, and, I know I'm speaking to the choir with that. You know, there's uh, shifting gears for one sec. There, I loved what you talked about uh, with the vulnerable job ad because you're, you're uh, you bring up the Cleveland Browns and God bless them. You know, ever you know, we all love the Cleveland Browns uh, to an extent. Um, I think this year they truly believe they may win a game, uh, maybe two or three or something. But tell me a little bit about what you mean by that. The vulnerable vulnerable job ad. Yeah. Well, on that same topic, I think. You know, um, like I was mentioning before, I, I think there's opportunities to be more vulnerable on both sides of the coin. So the candidates that are coming in for interview um, to be more vulnerable. And then also, you know, companies really need to start being a lot more vulnerable from the job ad and, and saying, you know, even approaching the market and saying, you know, um, it doesn't need to be necessarily verbatim this, but, you know, we're not doing so well or we are looking to replace one of our high performers. Again, it, it's just that kind of upfront honesty about where you're at. I think, you know, if you date, if you do say I'm struggling, I think you attract people that want to help you in that circumstance. And so, you know, that that's what happens in our personal relationships and more and more we're starting to see companies um, adopt that approach and say, if we're not doing so well right now, like, can you help us? Um, rather than going out and saying, we've had our best sales quarter ever. And again, as soon as that person comes into the company, they realize that you haven't and you've just lied to them up front. 
their response is going to be just to lie back to you. So I think there's opportunities for, for both companies, like right from the job ad, here's what we're looking for. I think that the reaction to that is going to be so much better. And it's going to be needed as we go into you know, this, this millennial generation. They kind of want to know the vulnerable truth rather than the crap that we've been feeding them. Absolutely. And, and you know, it's something where uh, when I, back when I was doing most of my recruiting, I found it to be imperative to tell people, as you said, the warts, because uh, there's no greater disappointment than a candidate being on an interview process and getting an offer, but being in a job that they did not know about blank, whatever it was. And so to me, I almost uh, had a tendency to over make it almost more negative than it was so that, that w- this way they'd be pleasantly surprised when things turned out a little bit better than they had expected. So it's, yeah, people don't well, do that, but it, they should, right? No, they don't do that. And we're still using the recruitment models that we were using in the industrial era, you know, through the forties <laughs> and fifties. And, right. And that doesn't add up. And, and, and one of the things is, <clears throat> you know, as the job, tenure continues to plummet internationally, not just in North America, internationally. If people are are going through job cycles within two to three years and they're moving somewhere else, really it's about getting the most out of them. And and I think what you'll start to see, like we do in sport, is you'll have people that specialize in certain, in helping certain types of companies. So there might be, you know, in the near future, people that specialize in helping companies that are underperforming and that's all they do. And once the company's back on their feet, you know, they go and help someone else. And, you know, we're looking at two to three years rather than trying to recruit people for 60 years like we used to. Well, absolutely. Because I, I think what we're hoping is to, to get two to three great years out of these people before they get a little restless and want to move on. Or they, maybe they, they've seen the sort of the ceiling to what they can accomplish there. And, and, and you're right. That makes much more sense. Nobody is staying at their, their version of IBM or Coca-Cola for 30 years anymore. Uh, that doesn't happen. Now, now there's, there's so many, you know, we don't have an enormous amount of time to cover this entire book, but there's so many great parts. I mean, I, I love what you talk about with, with leadership and coaching. I love the quote from Bill McCartney. Coaching is taking a player where he can't take himself. That's absolutely true. That, that makes a strong leader and a coach. And, you know, you talk a little bit about what is the perfect coach and what, what constitutes that. But tell me a little bit more about, in your opinion, just give me maybe two or three elements of what you believe makes a strong coach or a strong leader. Yeah, it's a really good question. And uh, I would be outside the norm in what I consider this to be. But um, uh, I think um, uh, the, the, one of the big traps that we've found ourselves in through this kind of continued adoption of the old processes that we used to use is that, uh, you know, we, we promote the wrong leaders. So whether they're just the loudest or whether they're the the top salesperson, they would get promoted into management. Um, whereas I I don't agree that those people are natural leaders. I think often what happens is the, the third or fourth best salesperson is actually the best leader. And, um, you know, we see it in sport where former players in, in a multitude of different sports aren't actually good coaches. People that didn't play professionally are actually the better coaches. And so um, what makes a good coach, I think, is, is definitely um, a great communicator. And what I mean by that is um, they're able to uh, communicate succinctly uh, both what's going on in the industry, um, you know, performance management. So for each individual person, how how they're performing and, and what they need to improve on and what they do well. And then also, um, it's almost like a, a parent or a, a you know a, a guide for for you know teenagers at camp is like you're trying to get these people to um, kind of have an outlook on on life and what they want to do um and people that can elicit that and have a, a high eq i think are the perfect coaches uh for the current generation uh, i understand that in previous generations it was very much kind of militaristic but i think those days are fast disappearing yeah, yeah. and l- listen i, I- you know, I think that when you said at the very start there, you know, your opinion may not be the, the common one necessarily, but, you know, your big, the book is filled with sort of your thoughts on certain things that, that 
fly against what common thought processes are now. And I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I love where you discuss uh, the, the suggestion that experience doesn't mean it's right. And you talk about the, uh, you know, the, 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 the captain of the Titanic and so forth. But, but it, you know, there's, there's so much that the conception needs to be transformed, but unfortunately so many people are, are kind of, taught or brought up a certain way and uh, so much of it is old school related stuff you know from my perspective for example you know uh when it involves coaching i i'll never forget being at a conference where there was um, some senior members of the coaching we'll say the the federation like the, the, the big governing group and i was chatting with them and i was talking a little bit about my my approach and my style and I said, well, you know, one of the things I love to do is I, I love to, when I'm coaching somebody, let's say I'm coaching you, Cody, I, I'm not going to spend my day or our hour or whatever time slot is sort of, sort of, um, I don't know what they call it, coaching. I'm supposed to, I guess, give you the tools and, and, but not do the tool, you know, not to do the work for you kind of a thing. You're supposed to self-discover. And I kind of, look, I'm from New York City. I don't have patience for anything. <laughs> and I don't have time or interest in waiting for you to figure stuff out. You're really good at what you do. I'm pretty good at what I do. I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you how to do this stuff. And I'm going to, if I have to do it for you, I will. And they were mortified. They're like, Oh my God, that's counter to everything we've always done. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah. So this is why maybe people are reluctant to use coaches because coaches, they're like chiropractors, no offense, chiropractors, but they, drag people forever. Like you're constantly going back for more therapy, constantly going back. And me, I just want to coach you to succeed and then have you succeed and we'll move on. And if I can show you how to do that in, in 12 minutes, then it's an incredibly valuable 12 minutes. Let's just do it. And it drives me bananas. And they were, and then I said, well, you know, and I, I, when I'm coaching people, I like to become friends with them and we, you know, we bond over things. And they're like, what? You become friends with them? Like, you're not supposed to do that, you know. I'm like, what do you mean? I'll have a beer with them. We'll talk about. Oh my god! And, and I was like, are you serious? But what's interesting is that, and and you bring this up so well in your book, Cody, that there are so many um, sort of quote rules or the ways things have been done for so long that are are just I don't know. And listen, I'm not a young guy at all. You're young. I'm not. But what I'll tell you is that I can't believe that people continue to do things this way. So I think that's why people need to grab this book is they really need to leaf through it and say, wow, you know what? I see why he's being grumpy and upset and whatever it is about certain ways. And I don't mean it that way, but you know, but he's right. I mean, if you leaf, leaf through this, it's great. Sorry, that was a run on sentence, but I just, I just had to vent, Cody. I'm sorry. So no, not a problem. I, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, the purpose of the book and even the name of it was to, to really challenge and say, you know, how you, how you create competitive advantages to look at different models and different ways of doing things. And, and leadership is just one, it's an easy one, I think. Um, unfortunately, like we've been talking about is the, the framework isn't set up for the right people to get into leadership positions. Again, we, we still hire a top salesperson and we promote him into to management, even though his best skill is selling stuff to other people. And, and that, skill set doesn't necessarily marry up with helping all the other salespeople be good at that. Um, but, you know, again, like even salary bands and things like that is all designed for people to go up and um, get into management and then coast. And that's not the best way to do it. In fact, it's, it's almost the opposite where the ideal scenario, and I, <laughs> I did a talk in Cleveland recently at Case Western Reserve University, and I told people that as a leader, your job is actually to make yourself redundant. So if your team is doing really well, they should be self-sufficient. Um, and once you've got them into a position where they're self-sufficient, they don't need you anymore. <laughs> and the looks on people's faces were just aghast. They, <laughs> they, they couldn't believe that. Um, that, you know, didn't mean redundant in terms of like your career is over. You would obviously just move on to the next challenge. But yeah, the, the old frameworks are keeping us making these bad decisions. And so the companies now that are willing to look where others won't, hence the name, they are going to be the ones that, that get ahead in the very, very near future because people are the competitive advantage. I don't care whether you love technology. It's not the technology that puts you ahead. It's the people. Well, 
Of course. And, and the people that think the right way, uh, you're, you know, it's funny. I, I've often said, uh, I used to do a fair amount of work, uh, in recruiting for compliance related people and legal, uh, attorneys, uh, as they tie in with, uh, the banking world and people would, uh, there'd be always a big uproar over the different administrations coming in, coming out, more regulation, less regulation. It's going to be the end of these people. It's going to be the end of this. And I say, no, it's not. Lawyers will always find a way to remain employed and relevant. It doesn't matter. They will always be there. You don't need to worry about that. But but that's what we're talking about. You just said a minute ago where, you know, what you need to do is basically figure out what's the best way to be relevant now, but then make yourself irrelevant, but you'll be relevant in another area and you'll continue to evolve, right? And that's exactly. The and, 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 you know, the, the, the sporting parallel here is if you look at, every single one of the most revered teams at the moment, the Warriors, the Patriots, um, you name it, you know, the Manchester United's of the old days, the teams that win a lot, they, they operate at the edges. And so they have built their whole um, frameworks of everything they do around being at the edges and being where others won't. They, you know, the way the Patriots recruit is unlike anyone. Um, you know, the way that Draymond Green plays for the Warriors is literally on the edge of implosion at all times. That's where he operates the best. And so if you don't like him, that's fine. But the team operate really well when he's right on the edge. And so, yeah, I, I think people are scared of being on the edge because uh, you can easily topple off. But honestly, that's where you get ahead. It's not being in the middle. And there's a lot of people and a lot of companies that are in the middle. Well, and that's where they'll stay unless they adapt, right? It's, and that's, but you know what? It's, <laughs> I always like to say, thank God for stupid people because they make me look semi intelligent, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, I'm glad they're there. But, uh, you know, that's. Well, someone's got to be in the middle, right? Well, exactly. And I'd, I'd rather not be there. That's usually where you get beat up or you get hit with a snowball or something happens. <laughs> so it's uh, bad. Well, look, you know, at the end of the day, the, the book itself, Cody, is fantastic because you really pull together a whole lot of great ideas. So I, you know, congrats on that. And, uh, you know, we'll talk about all the promotional stuff later, but, but jump on Amazon and just grab it. You will, you'll love the read everybody who is listening. It's, it's a, it's a, it's an easy book to read in the way that it, it's, uh, it makes a ton of sense, but it also, uh, you know, I joke with people sometimes when I say some books really don't, stimulate me too much, get me too fired up. Um, this one actually did allow a couple of the brain cells to come together and meet up and, and greet each other. And <laughs> so it was a very, it was, it was great. I, I really, it stretched me out. I loved it. It was uh, well done. So look forward to the next book, Cody. Is there a next book? Yeah, I'm working on that now. So uh, a few of the concepts that I delve into in where others won't, I'm going to dig a little bit deeper and yeah, build some frameworks around them. Um, so yeah, I, not sure on release date yet, but it's being worked on. Excellent. Excellent. Look forward to that. All right. I, I need to shift gears now and, and actually talk to you a little bit about Aussie rules football. Um, maybe one or two or 3.5 of the, my listeners might know a lot about it, but maybe they don't. So give me the general overview of the game and, and what you'd compare it to. I have an idea what you'll say, but go ahead and give me the, the basic rundown for us uh, uneducated uh, North American fans. Well, most people see it and think that it's rugby and it's definitely not. In fact, there's probably not a worse parallel than rugby, but um, uh, I would say that the, the, definitely the closest sport is Gaelic football that they play in Ireland, but it, it has elements of lacrosse, basketball, soccer. It's played on an oval a cricket sized oval, uh, 18 players on each side. So there's 36 people on the field at any given time. Uh, it's very fast, like ice hockey. There's hitting like ice hockey. We don't wear pads. Um, and if you've stumbled home from the bar and flicked on ESPN at 2 a.m., you've probably <laughs> seen a game. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I think the, the latest stat was it's the fourth most attended weekly sport in the world. So the average is about. 50 or 60,000 people and only played professionally in Australia. So it's a very, very big industry in Australia, you know, billion dollar TV rights, all that sort of stuff. And uh, yeah, just, it captivates a lot of people, very fast moving, uh, very hard hitting um, and just an exciting sport. And, and like you mentioned before, it, 
definitely should be played more internationally um, because it is fast moving and uh, it basically never stops for, you know, 30 minutes per quarter. So how, how would you recommend if you, if someone said, Cody, let's grow the sport globally, how do we do it? It's a good question. Uh, honestly, I, I think um, we need to just uh, give access to more people. I, I think anyone that I run into on the street that says they've been to Australia and been to a game, they are now addicted to the sport. And the thing that I love about the guys that I coach here in Canada, they're all Canadians, they're not Aussies. Um, you know, once they've seen it, they're, they're up, up at 2 a.m. watching the games and they subscribe to the package and, you know, go and watch games during the week and, and things like that. So I think once you've kind of either seen it live or seen it on TV, um, you're pretty hooked. And so the expansion I think needs to come, that's, that's one part of it. And then obviously that kind of leads you into participation, which we're starting to see in, in North America. We're expanding both US and Canada. Um, so it's getting there. Yeah, it's tough because, uh, you know, one of the things I did uh, – uh, going back a little bit was uh, I was involved for a while in helping a, a company that did uh, sports uh, franchise uh, buying and selling of the sports franchises. And one of the areas that they were looking to really jump forward was the uh, rugby, but the rugby sevens uh, here in the States and try to create a professional league and so forth. And, and I think, you know, I, I don't know how you feel specifically about rugby itself, but it's, it's also a sport that's a, a very physical sport. Um, I like to say that uh, without pissing off legions of other sports fans, but real men play it and women play it. And it's uh, um, both of them, both, uh, you know, Aussie rules football and rugby and so forth. It's, you know, no pads, but you get true athletes that are running nonstop. It's a, it's a, they, they fall down. They may, there may be some blood, but there's no, uh, nobody uh, complaining about that. And, uh, you know, no yellow flags and that sort of thing. And, and I think that that ha would have such strong appeal, uh, especially amongst here in the States with, uh, a lot of the issues that the NFL is facing with, uh, you know, the concussion related stuff and, uh, you know, all the, uh, you know, there's just a lot of angst going on around the sport itself. And I think people, if they started to get involved with whether it's Aussie rules, football, rugby, et cetera, down here, I think that would really help the growth. Definitely. Yeah. And it's funny because when people ask me about sport and, and particularly about injuries, um, because it is very hard hitting and, and you tend to see the highlights packages, which accentuate a lot of the hits, but um, it's actually a relatively safe sport in that part of learning to play it is learning to tackle, be tackled, um, check. So we, we basically check like hockey um, and, and you learn how to do that. So you learn how to hit safely. You learn how to tackle safely. You learn how to be tackled. You learn how to tumble and all sorts of different things. And because we're not wearing pads, you can't just crush people. Um, so it is, uh, it's actually a very safe sport and because it's 360, you can kind of be tackled from all sorts of different directions. It's not just head on like football or rugby. And yeah, I mean, it, just to kind of go back to the rugby sevens parallel as well, AFL has been trying to do condensed versions of the game for a little while. And I don't think it's really taken off. I think, uh, ours is a sport that it really needs you know, the, the kind of traditional game to be at the forefront rather than a condensed version um, just because of the space. Like uh, it's just such a big field. I don't think the game translates very well to a smaller field. Well, it's, it's, it's certainly tough. I mean, I know that uh, other sports have tried to do this a same or similar thing and it's, it's, it's challenging, but then you also have the challenge of, well, how many communities have the space and the room for an AFL uh, field, right? I mean, it's, it's, it is a big space. I, I know that not yes. much of that, not much of that happening here in Manhattan. Um, but uh, someday, maybe there'll be one floating in the sky somewhere now. Uh, but you know, what's interesting is that I, uh, I, I completely uh, agree with everything you said about the AFL, but as it ties into rugby, I played um, in college and um, it, when I first was playing, I originally thought, gee, this will be a, a dangerous sport. And, you know, I'm sure my parents thought the same thing. And, oh, my God, you know, don't break your whatever. But as we play, and you're right, not only do you learn how to 
tackle properly and and effectively avoid injury by playing it the right way. But it's also such a, uh, I don't know how this sounds, but a gentlemanly sport. You you don't go into this thinking, how am I going to absolutely annihilate my opponent? How am I going to make him die and all this stuff? It's that there's not that me versus that person. It's how do I perform well in the game? How do I score? How do I, you know, how do we win? But I'm not going to necessarily run this guy over because I hate him and I, you know, hate the opponent. And after the match, it's always the, you know, the, you know, you, you, you hang out together, you drink together, you sing songs together. It's a, it's a celebration of the sport. It's not, you know, us versus them. And when you go to the matches, it's not like in soccer where, you know, the hooligans, they all want to kill each other. It's, it's everyone's partying, having a great time and enjoying the spectacle of the sport. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, there was a, an AFL final on this morning. Uh, my team played and there was a hundred thousand people there and yeah, it's a, it's a stadium full of uh, supporters from both teams sitting next to each other. And, you know, they're from, you know, literally suburbs next to each other in Melbourne and it, it, it's, it's all fine. And, um, and yeah, there, there is that kind of gentlemanly aspect, not only to the crowd, but on the field as well. And, you know, there'll be circumstances in Aussie rules where the ball is directly in between you and an opponent and, and you've got to go and get the ball and, and put your head down to pick it up. And funnily enough, the, the way that you do that safely is by you both going at 100%. And again, you learn how to do that. And you learn how to hit people as fast as possible. And that's actually the safest way to do it. The way to get injured is when one person pikes out of that contest and goes yeah. at 75%, yeah. that's when they yeah. fall and break someone's leg. And so, yeah, it, it, in, it doesn't make much sense when you just talk about it. But when you see, um, yeah, you, when you see how actually safe it is when everyone's doing it properly, um, it's a really attractive sport. So Cody, what you need to do right now, or maybe wait a few minutes till after the podcast is post some, uh, whether it's, uh, on your social media somewhere, find some links to some, uh, you know, whether it's, uh, some YouTube videos or anything, uh, maybe a primer, uh, video of what, what some of the listeners can check out. And, uh, you know, whether it's a uh, footage of a, a recent match or if it's footage of uh, someone talking about the sport itself, I think it'd be great to, uh, get more of the word out there because I, you know, it's funny when you say, you know, if you stumble in <laughs> at 2am and it's on, uh, you know, God invented TiVo and DVRs for a reason. And that was to, so you can actually watch it at 8pm or another time where you, when it's more suitable. Um, so I always tell people God invented TiVo, he saves marriages and all, <laughs> whatever it's everything. But but, uh, all right, so that's so we've covered your book, which is fabulous. We covered the Aussie Rose football. Next on the uh, little agenda here is uh, your company uh, that you're partners with. Um, tell me more about what it is you specifically are doing and what you're ho- hoping to do going forward with the company. And yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. We So, um, yeah, like I mentioned, we're a, an event and marketing company in endurance sports, and so... We operate um, our own events. We partner with certain events. So um, one that's on the horizon at the moment is Major League Triathlon. So we're an event partner for them, which is all you know, built for TV, built for um, uh, spectator triathlon where you see the whole race basically from one spot, which is run out of the States. It's a brilliant little uh, up-and-coming league. Um, that's featuring a bunch of Olympians. And so as the event partner, we'll go down and, and you know, everything from course to entertainment afterwards to beer gardens, um, we, we help operate that. Um, and then on the marketing side as well, we help brands in the industry um, cut through with their, you know, whether it's their social media or their ongoing marketing. Um, we help events with their marketing throughout the year. Um, generally what events do is they'll kind of talk to, people that are running the marathon, you know, a month before and maybe a week afterwards and then you don't hear from them again. So there's some little things that um, the industry kind of needs to modernize. And so we help with that process. And um, we also have a, a site, which is essentially the Players' Tribune for endurance sports. So really kind of um, gritty stories about, you know, the, the inner voice of, of endurance athletes. So you get to hear what their inner dialogue is saying when they're, you know, 10 miles into the Hawaiian Ironman marathon and their body's shutting down, like how they kind of talk themselves through that. So that's been a really interesting thing. And, and we created that um, a couple of years ago and, and it's been a, 
it's been interesting to watch the uptake of that. So, um, yeah, we're, we're kind of in that space where we do a bunch of different things at the moment, but um, all intermingled around endurance sports. Got it. That sounds great. Well, look, and, and I'm assuming you tie in a lot of what you talk about in the book and, uh, and as you, as you do as a coach into how, how you're running, uh, NTSQ. So I think it's, you're, uh, it sounds like you're really tying together a, a, a few different things into one, uh, nice, uh, nice package. So that's, that's great. There's, um, there's a quote that you did in, you mentioned in the book that, that really resonated with me. And it was, uh, you know, don't focus on winning, focus on being tough to beat. Tell me a little bit about what you mean by that. Yeah, so I think um, we get obsessed with winning very easily, um, but really winning, whether it's in business or in sport, is actually a byproduct. And so the process of learning how to win is more important than winning itself, um, which I think is one of the big misunderstandings that we have. Like when we see coaches come out, you know, in a post-game press conference and talk about you know, how they feel that they lost the game rather than the opponents beat them. Um, that's 100% true. They actually believe that. And so, yeah, going through that process and educating people how to win is more important than, than winning itself, whether that's, you know, training your salespeople how to close the deal. There might be a good opener, but not a good closer. That process of learning how to close um, is more important than the actual deal itself. But we just... I think we get fascinated with that one deal um, rather than analyzing how they could improve the, their individual performance. And so long way of answering a pretty simple question, but that's what I was trying to get at. No, I think that's great. And, and I think we were sort of joking about the other day and I want to, I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot right now. And I'm going to make this part of my hit your mark segment. So the hit your mark segment is usually towards the end of the podcast. And I throw a few questions at you, but the first one is, um, I spend a lot of my uh, waking hours behind a desk and behind a computer screen, and I don't really have the opportunity to be um, like the people you see on Instagram and everywhere else that are uh, beautiful, perfect, buff people that are spending four hours a day in a gym. Today is my you know, elbow day where I get to lift little weights on my elbow skin right here, and the other day is my pinky day and all this stuff. Well, and then in between the, all the foodies that have, you know, the chance to spend four hours in the kitchen cooking the perfect meal. So me, I don't have that kind of time. Give me three things I can do right now, Cody. So I have a, I like to say I have a six pack set of abs underneath my six pack abs. So I've got a 12 pack, um, which is probably not good. Uh, so how can I get rid of the top six pack to get to the bottom one? What do you, you know, give me a couple things that I can do that are really, uh, are not going to take a lot of time out of my day and it's not going to require me to go to some, uh, high end gym to do. Well, are you sitting behind your desk right now? I am. Okay. So, uh, we'll stand up and I'll stand up as well. All right. Very, very easy one. Um, and anyone can do this It's, it's one of the most underutilized, uh, exercises. It's just squats. Um, so, you know, feet shoulder width apart and you're going to poke your bum out a little bit and then drop your bum down as if you're sitting down. Now, if you do 20 of those, 50 of those, a hundred of those and, and repeat it every day, um, that's one way that you can start to build a little bit of a base. Um, it actually works a lot more than your legs, believe it or not. Uh, well, I was so just going to say, cause I feel it in, I do feel it in my calves and my thighs, but not as much in my, uh, my tummy. So how does that, I guess that's the core, right? I'm going to learn the lingo now. That's the <laughs> core, right? So, how, um, but that's great. Good. What else? Uh, if you want to get out from behind your desk, I would really recommend finding something that you love doing. So if you don't like running, you don't have to run. If you don't like cycling, you don't have to cycle. If you, whatever it is, I really recommend finding something you actually love to do. If that's just walking, that's fine. Um, I think people kind of read men's health or women's health and, and do the latest buzz thing, but they don't really enjoy it mentally. Um, and that's why they drop off their exercise program. So, you know, my advice is to find something that you actually like doing and then find ways to do that more. Um, so for instance, for me, 
mine is, you know, I, I'm in a, a business around cycling and triathlon, but I actually really like running just because it's so mindless. I don't need to think about anything. I can kind of drift off into my own world. I absolutely love that process. Now, um, that's, that's pretty good. But did you know that you can go the same distance if you jump, you know, just jump in a car and you can just drive that distance. You don't need to run. Did you, just, just that I'd let you know. No, that's no, not, that, not mindless though. Oh, that's a good point. Very, uh, <laughs> Maybe see, for some people. <laughs> <laughs> see, I was right there. I was focusing on winning and not being tough to beat. So that's a problem there. But uh, uh, third no, no, one, I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Third one is uh, just your diet. So um, another big myth in the industry is that exercise is what helps you lose weight or get fit. The first thing to fix is, is always your diet. So don't buy into the, you know, the biggest loser kind of thing where you just see them, they look like they're exercising 24 seven and they lose a bunch of weight. Right. Uh, easiest thing to, to fix is your diet. And so whether you want to go the whole hog or not, you know, often it can just be drinking two cans of Coke instead of four. Like that's a progression. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, you don't need to go and just eat vegetables for a month and, and try and lose a hundred pounds, um, <laughs> small, make small little incremental things. And then again, uh, just, uh, just a little asterisk is that, um, a lot of the, the most recent findings on food is that it's very individual and they think it's, it's DNA based. And so really it's about finding the foods that are, are good for you rather than, because Jamie Oliver says that you should do it or because the Instagram model says that you should drink this green smoothie, that might actually not be great for you. So really it's about trying to identify uh, what's good for you in, in terms of your fitness and weight loss and, and whatever else. Well, that's a great point. And, you know, one of the things that I, I uh, was advised to do a couple of years ago was just was to stop putting sugar in my coffee because I used to go like, whoosh, whoosh, you know, sugar and drink, you know, my 37 cups of coffee in the morning and that sort of thing. So cutting that out, maybe a baby step. So I, you know, I think it's helped. Maybe I'd be an extra 700 pounds if I kept that, that sugar going. But, but I think the other thing though, is that sometimes uh, just the art of substitution versus, you know, if you take out those, let's say two cans of Coca-Cola a day, well, what, you know, what's the appropriate substitute? Well, it might be water. It might be something else. Or the same thing goes with, well, chief, I'm not going to eat this piece of bread because uh, I don't want those just the, all that all those carbs. What do I substitute it with? And that's I think that's the that's the challenge, and that's the most important thing is what is the right substitute that you don't have to spend fourteen hours cooking? It can be just a carrot. It can be a whatever. And that that I think is what's maybe missing with some of the the, the diets out there and so forth. You know, is well, what's the realistic substitution? Definitely. Yeah. Well, um, I, I'm not into this world. I'm not into really giving advice on this sort of stuff, but I can talk from my own experience. What I, um, even just, um, uh, a sweet potato, you quarter it, um, almost like big planks and you chuck that in the, in the oven and let it cook until it's soft. And, and that's a great snack. You might only eat half of it, but, um, you know, sweet potato doesn't have that kind of white starchy thing that, um, that white potatoes do, you know, put a little bit of cinnamon or some, some sort of spice on it. And there you go. There's your afternoon snack. So yeah, little things like that. Um, but again, it's going to be what you like. Uh, yeah. Could be carrots, could be carrots with natural peanut butter. That's great as well. Um, I think the thing is like you mentioned, uh, cutting out your sugars, um, what you actually, what you start to realize when you cut out sugar is that your palate starts to change. And so vegetables actually taste a lot better. Um, and a whole range of different foods and spices taste a lot better because your, your taste buds aren't searching for that sugar. Well, that just took out 94% of my diet, but all right. Um, <laughs> and, uh, no, I, actually I'm, I'm pretty good eater, pretty healthy eater, but I, it's, it, it's tough. It's, it can be tough, right? It, now the, um, you know, I used to have, and you'll be happy to hear this as an Aussie, but, uh, uh, many years ago when I was commuting on a train, uh, a friend and I, we had what we called the Foster's diet. And, uh, that was basically on the way home, we'd drink a can of Foster's, but by the time we got home, it sort of hit the stomach and we were not as hungry and we wouldn't eat as much. So that was my theory on how to lose weight was I'd be, you know, not eating like a giant steak. I'd have half the steak cause I'd be like, Oh man, I'm full. So, um, I'm not sure if that would cater to uh, a lot of the 
Instagram people and so forth out there, but you know, worked for me. Anyway, well, look, I, I want to jump now to the, my, my fun little segment here. And the first thing I want to ask you right off the bat is, um, give me an example of, uh, somebody that that's out there that maybe, I don't want to say an idol, but someone that you've always wanted to meet. And once you met them, you're kind of like, Oh man, what am I going to say now? Like a little speechless. Like, is there somebody out there that that's happened to you with? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, not really. Um, I've always found that once you've kind of broken that barrier with, um, whether they're celebrities or just idols that most of them are just really regular people. Um, and, uh, you know, I haven't met a lot of celebrities in my life. I've kind of tried to sh- shy away from that, but from meeting, you know, professional athletes and, um, I've always found everyone really down to earth and they're usually more interested in me than I am in like learning about them. So sorry to, sorry to kind of first question, turn it oh, around man. on you. But, you just, uh, I, what a disaster. <laughs> no, no, but you know, it's, I, and, and no, I, it's the irony is that actually pretty much most people say that. And, and it's funny because I think that we have this, when people see other people on TV and so forth, I, I think we tend to elevate them, but you're right. When you meet them in person, they're regular people. Number one, number two, uh, I think they, uh, a celebrity or, a, you know, a, whether it's a sports figure, entertainment, et cetera, what they do is they, they get really excited talking to other people that don't come up to them and say, Oh my God, you're so-and-so, but they're just talking, you know, regular, whatever it is. Um, I, however, I will admit myself that, um, almost 30 years ago, I met uh, Paul McCartney along with a couple other people. Uh, he was coming out of a radio station interview and I was in the lobby of that radio station stalking him. I mean, um, just trying to be there and say hi to him. And I definitely did one of those, uh, you know, blah, 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 you know. but other people were chatting and he was such a friendly guy and he hung out with us for five minutes, uh, which was amazing. But that was my only time I really had the, uh, <laughs> but I was curious about that. Um, Throw out three people you think you'd love to have a drink with today. If they were alive, dead, doesn't matter. Easy. Um, Malcolm Gladwell, one. Very easy. Uh, Simon Sinek, one of my favorite authors. And Bill Belichick. And I'd actually like all three of them to be together. I want to shoot the shit with all three of them and, and workshop some ideas. Um, now, what if Bill Belichick showed up not in a hoodie? Whatever he's comfortable in. Wow, you're very accommodating. Look at that. I, uh, as a Giants fan, I just uh, I struggle with that answer, but I, I guess that's uh, one I'll have to live with. I'm, and, a, Giant, uh, I'm a Giants fan as well, but uh, if at my dinner party, I, I've got so many questions for you. <laughs> I guess so, right? That's great. And um, what is, you know, I, I guess what I'd like to, to hear from you is, um, as a coach in Aussie Rose football, what is, you know, give me – you know, one of your major messages you like to give, uh, let's say you just meet one of your new players for the first time. What are, you know, what do you like to tell them to get them used to what your style is? Uh, well, so my style is built around my players and so I don't kind of come in with a, a game plan. So really it's, my question is, what are you good at? Uh, what do you feel comfortable with? What is, you know, what's your superpower? because I can win games of Aussie rules in a bunch of different ways. Um, and so them getting comfortable is more so just being comfortable with, I want them to do what they're best at. You know, it's funny you should say that because, you know, I coach uh, a little bit different. I'm coaching little league baseball team with, with teenagers and I'll often ask them the first day, you know, so tell me what's your, you know, what position do you play? Uh, I play any position coach. Oh, no, no, no. What, what do you really love playing? Whatever you think I should play at coach. I'm like, Oh Jesus, <laughs> no, come on. What, what are you really best at? Well, I guess I'm okay at, you know, it's so funny to draw that out of even the kids. They, uh, they're like, well, I'll play wherever you want me to play. That's isn't that your job. Figure it out. And I'm like, well, yeah, but I, you know, where are you going to excel? Right. That's the whole point. Uh, cool. And, uh, lastly, I think what I, what I want to know is, um, you know, you've written, uh, you know, written this book, you've done a lot of great work, you've been involved in athletics and so on for most of your life. But in terms of a legacy and what you'd love to leave behind, I mean, what kind of met, you know, you know, when people uh, look back on Cody, I mean, what do you, what do you want them to think about regarding you? Great question. I've, I've thought about this a lot recently. Um, and I think it is really 
you know, the challenging the status quo. Um, and so between the book, which like you mentioned before is, is very off the wall and, you know, look at this idea over here. This is very, very different, right? The way to the name of our company, NTSQ is not the status quo or never the status quo. And so I would like my legacy, you know, when they're reading my eulogy to say, um, you know, here's someone that was willing to uh, look differently at the world and, and not just go along with the herd. And, um, you know, was willing to present those ideas, not just kind of be in a bar huddled in the corner over a beer saying, you know, this should be different, but was actually prepared to go, you know, go out to the market and write a book and, and put the ideas out there rather than, yeah, being that kind of angry guy in the corner like everyone else. <laughs> I'm the happy guy in the corner. What are you talking about? If I have a beer in my hand, I'm good. But no, no I completely get what you're saying. And so, Cody, uh, what's the best way for people to be involved with your world? How, what's the best way to reach you and where can they find your book, all that sort of thing? Yeah, so the book is available through Amazon. So you can just search where others won't or my name, Cody Royal in the search bar there and it'll pop up both. There's no other books named that and there's <laughs> no other people named Cody Royal. There's, I think there's a kid, I found a kid on, on Facebook that's named Cody Royal, but I think he's the only other one. Um, he's, he's somewhere in Denver. We look very different. So, um, and, and his book is called Here Others Don't. So I think <laughs> exactly. you're okay there. Very confusing. <laughs> uh, my, my lawyers have been in touch with him. Yeah, um, exactly. So yeah, the book is, uh, is available through Amazon and, um, you can reach me at Cody at where others com as well. And uh, I'm always up for a chat. I'm always up to help people give advice, um, anything to do with the book or sports or trying to break in or whatever it may be. Please feel free to get in touch with me. Oh, that's, that's amazing. Well, Cody, I, I truly appreciate you being here on the Make Your Mark podcast. And, and you've made it pretty clear throughout how you're making your mark out there. And I, I love the name of, uh, of your company, the NTSQ being not the status quo, I think it's fabulous. Uh, great. You need to put that on your website somewhere. I, I, I didn't really know that. And I'd love to see that more somehow on there because I think that's a great name. Um, but that's subject for another discussion. Have a, have an awesome rest of the day, Cody. It's been great chatting with you. Thanks for being on the podcast and, uh, look forward to seeing your new book coming up. Thanks, Mark. Looking forward to getting together when I'm in the city. Oh, that'd be great. All the best. Thanks so much for joining us today on this episode of Make Your Mark Podcast. The goal of the podcast is to help you find ways to make your mark, to succeed in life, and to jump past your competition. Be sure to leave me a review on iTunes and Stitcher and subscribe to be the first to hear new episodes. If you're looking for ways to make your mark, send me an email, mark at markmoyer.com, and I'll get back to you right away. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time.